make the same effort to follow, and to change, and to grow. And the challenge was to pray about areas in your life where you feel you may be being complacent. And that God would show you that and reveal that to you. And then get with somebody to have a conversation. Because what I have found in my own life is I can come up and, and see things, but if I don't sit down and have a conversation and, and, and solidify those thoughts and then plan something, it was just a great half hour, hour discussion in my mind, but nothing changes as I move forward. And so I sort of thrown that out as a challenge to us. Now maybe you forgot and you didn't remember, but maybe this week, with the challenge at the end of this lesson, you can add that one in there as well. Or maybe you can realize that maybe you are complacent because you just didn't take the challenge to heart last week. And that's an area in your life you've become complacent. Just saying. But we all have different struggles, amen? That's true. Yeah. As I shared, today's lesson is His will, His word, His wisdom. And we're going to continue on in Proverbs chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me over there. Now, I know that we live in a technological age, and you may have noticed in the last number of lessons, there's nothing up there except that nice picture of the cross. Because I think sometimes we can even become complacent in that, that the speaker is going to do all the work and put it all up there for you. You're just going to sit there and you might jot something down or, versus actually turning over to your device or your paper in your Bible and actually follow along and read. Right, yeah. Just saying. Come on. Or taking that device and actually putting notes in of stuff that hits you. Yeah. Or writing stuff down to come back and revisit. Fair enough. Are you with me? Yeah. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 2. Okay. Starts off very similar as in uh, verse 8 of chapter 1. He says, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom, Applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and you look for it as for silver, and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of the faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair. Every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. Wisdom will save you from the ways of the wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who have left the straight paths to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in perverseness of evil whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Wisdom will save you also from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant that she made before God. Surely her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. Thus, you will walk in the ways of the good and keep in the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land, and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the unfaithful will be torn from it. As I said, very similar to Proverbs 1. In fact, they kind of go hand in hand. But I have a couple points that I'd like us to look at from this and be able to take as we move forward. The first thing I want to talk about is, again, it starts off, we're in a position of learning. We would call it discipleship. But I don't care what you do in your life. We are always in a position of learning. Whether you're a student in school, whether you're in a job, in a career. Whatever you're doing, you always are learning. And so the term discipleship should not offend us or bother us. Because everyone is in a position as a student right. in whatever you do in life. And so Proverbs, as we talk through about the wisdom of it, is starting off by saying, hey, listen, <clears throat> you're a student. Learn from these words. And it says we have a choice. That's how it starts off right from the get-go. We're called to accept 
to store up and to apply what we learn. That is what we're supposed to do. But what does it mean to apply? It means to put into practice. Mm -hmm. You know, I often share when I'm studying the Bible with people, if you walked into a class and a teacher had a formula on the board and said, turn over to your textbook this question and do the work, and you look at it, you start putting the input into the formula, when you get to your answer, you go to the back of the book, you look it up, and if your answer is wrong, you don't automatically assume the formula is wrong. You assume that maybe you did something wrong, and you go back and you find you put the wrong sign in or something, and then you get the right answer. But the only way you know the formula works is by working it, right. applying it, doing it. The only way you know the Bible works is if you put it into practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are a lot of people who know the Bible but don't really apply it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what ends up happening is we've got to put into practice. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, wisdom, it's one thing to know something in your short-term memory. Wisdom is something different. Let me give you an example from my high school days. Okay. I did not like calculus. And in my last year of high school, I failed calculus. And I had to go to summer school. And I needed to pass and get a good grade in order to be able to get into university. And so it just so happens that me and my buddy Kenny, we both failed, so we're both in summer school together. Okay. Our teacher from our school year is our summer school teacher. <laughs> Halfway through summer school, my, my friend Kenny has 100% in the class, and I have 96. This is the same teacher who failed us. I couldn't understand. Well, what is going on? What I found out later is, during the school year, as our high school teacher, he did not want to know that you just knew the information. He wanted to know that you could apply it mm. to different questions. Mm. Well, I'm very good short-term memory, F at X. But then you put it into a question, I'm like, I don't know how that works. Summer school, they just wanted to make sure you knew the basics. Well, I knew the basics really well. <laughs> he wasn't asking questions about application. Uh -huh. So I did really well. Mm. I think there are a lot of people who know the Bible, mm -hmm. but the application of it is not there. Mm -hmm. And so wisdom, they don't understand mm -hmm. biblical wisdom. Sure. We also need to have the right attitude about God's word in order to gain understanding. That's what verse 5 says. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. We've got to have the right attitude. In John chapter 8, you can write this down. John 8, verse 31 and 32. A group of people who believe who Jesus is come to him. And Jesus says to them something very simply. To the Jews who had believed in Jesus, said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really a Christian. You're really a disciple. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I don't know how many times I have conversations with people, and their mindset is, can you prove this is true, and then I'll believe it. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You put it into practice, and you'll see that it's true. Mm -hmm. Just like that formula. You don't know if that formula is right or wrong until you apply it and find out. That's good. The second thing I want to talk about, that we are called to value wisdom like a treasure. In verse 3, Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. Do we value wisdom? Biblical wisdom? Do we value God's Word? It calls out to us. It cries aloud. We're called to search for it. It takes a level of effort, a level of energy, and a level of sacrifice to pursue it. You know, on TV sometimes you can see these guys treasure hunters. 
Hmm. Mm -hmm. They're going after the Titanic, and they're going. Oak Island is a big one, right? I think the treasure they're they're looking for is how many people watch so they can get advertising dollars. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's a whole other story. But you see these people, and they dedicate their lives and their fortune and everything to go pursue this treasure. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that we need to pursue wisdom as if it's a treasure, if it's silver. Mm -hmm. Turn me over to Matthew, chapter 13, because Jesus would give us a parable about the same point. You know, those treasure hunters, they spent, they sacrificed a lot, their time, their energy, their money to pursue. Jesus would say in Matthew 13 and verse 44, that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure, Hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had to buy that field. Mm -hmm. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had to buy it. Do we look at God's wisdom as a pearl of great price? Do we look at it as a, a, a treasure that we have found and then we proceed to Whatever it takes to, to get it. Back to Proverbs. Come on, Marty. My next point <coughs> is wisdom saves us. Wisdom saves us. It saves us from two examples. The first one is it saves us from wicked men. Again, similar to chapter uh, Proverbs 1. That, that gang, hey, why don't you throw in with us? Remember I shared that analogy of people I know who would sit around in the bathroom at a big mall and wait for some unsuspecting person to go in and then yeah. mug them? That was Proverbs 1 talking about that. Well, here it's just talking about wicked men who entice us to join in with them. <coughs> To take shortcuts in our life, and I talked about four of them last week, our education, our careers, financially, and our relationships. <coughs> but he talks about these wicked men calling us and enticing us to leave the straight path. The straight path doesn't necessarily mean a road that's just flat. It's talking about morally how we're going to live our life. You know, I was watching uh, some sports clips yesterday, and it was a baseball game, and a home run hit out in, into the uh, left center field, and it was sort of an empty section, not a lot of fans there. And kid, I don't know, maybe about eight years old, ran up, he got the ball. And so he turned around to some of the fans behind, and the commentators talking about, well, that's probably the greatest treasure of his life, and he's gonna hold on to that, and he's, he's going on about how this kid's gonna hold on to this ball. So now he walks down to the front, and there's some other smaller kids sitting there. And he doesn't know the kid, but he could see the kid really wanted the ball. So he literally went up to him and said, you have it. And gave the ball. And the commentator at that point now has to backtrack. <laughs> and he said, the next time you're feeling discouraged about humanity, remember this picture. <laughs> wow. I think all of us, when we were younger, there's a certain sense of morality in us. Yeah. That the world disciples out of us. That's right. But wisdom is trying to reinstill it in us. To care for one another. To reach out to one another. He who has the most toys doesn't win at the end of the day. Come on. One of my favorite Christmas movies, It's a Wonderful Life. He who has friends will never be poor. That's kind of the end of that movie. The morals that God, I believe, has instilled in us, but we allow the world, wicked men, to entice from us. In 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 33, and I read it last week, it says, Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses like you ought. And it's amazing as Christians, we're called to engage in the world and share our faith and be involved with non-Christians. But the question is, are we influencing them? Yeah. Or are they influencing us? And this is a challenge. 
If you're involved in a situation that's causing you to become more and more like the world, then you need to get radical and make a decision to get out of that situation. Yep. Yeah. Oh, but that's not very loving. Okay, so if you are willing to lose your salvation to stay in that situation, how valuable is your salvation? Right. Bad company corrupts good character. I'm not saying we should isolate ourselves in our home and do navel gazing, and, you know. But be cautious the crowd in which we form around. Yeah. In verse 13 says, who have left the straight paths to walk in dark ways. When I read that, I thought, those who left the straight paths, and what hit me was, could that be referring to people who once enjoyed fellowship with us? Mm. Who made a decision to no longer follow God, no longer walk in the direction of Jesus? But now, instead of trying to encourage you in your faith, they're trying to entice you to follow them instead of Jesus. I know a lot of brothers and sisters who enjoyed sweet fellowship who have stopped following were still friends. Mm -hmm. They don't try to entice me to leave. And I know others who are constantly ridiculing the decision I've made. Well, why? Because if I can get rid of the messenger, then I don't have to deal with the message. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But every moment that you stay faithful is just a knife in their heart that they've walked away from God. Mm -hmm. So don't give up your faith. The second way that wisdom saves us is from the adulterous woman. Adultery. Adultery is a situation where someone has broken their marital vows to their spouse. They've broken that covenant of sexual purity that they vowed to their spouse. The Bible often talks about sexual purity, fidelity, moral convictions. But as I was reading through this and as I shared last week, could this be an allegory? Could this be an example Proverbs is talking about regarding our relationship with God? Because the Bible teaches that we are in a marriage with God. That's right. Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the bride. And wisdom is there to help us in that relationship. To help prevent us from violating our vows to God. In other words committing adultery against God. If you want to read a great book in how much God loves us and how adulterous we can be, read the book of Hosea. Where God uses a physical example of what His relationship with Israel in the Old Testament is. Yeah. And yet how Hosea's wife acted and yet how Hosea kept coming back because that's what God expected of him to set an example of how God keeps calling us back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is an incredible, incredible book. Mm -hmm. Finally, in conclusion, we are called to store up God's commands. But in order to store them up, we need to know them. Mm -hmm. In order to apply our heart to understanding... We need to put it into practice. Are you with me so far? Well, yeah. James 1. And again, what I've been doing through these studies is I've been going from the Proverbs into the New Testament to show you the consistency of God's Word. Yeah. The Old Testament is not different from the New Testament. It is all God's Word. And in James 1, in verse 22... James says, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. We are called 
to not merely listen to God's word, but do it. The challenge last week was about our complacency. Mm -hmm. So here's my chat. Well, this is a different challenge. Okay. You can write this one down. But my challenge from last week, I'll apply this week. Are you merely listening to the word and not doing what it says? Mm -hmm. Why not? Well, it's too hard. It's too challenging. God demands too much. Do you know in the garden, there was one command. Don't eat the fruit on that tree. And they broke it. I think it comes down to our desire in our heart. Do we really want to apply our heart to God's wisdom and obey it? Is it hard? Absolutely it's hard. Why is it hard? Because sin is pleasurable. If it wasn't, if sin was like hitting yourself in the toe with a hammer, you'd, it'd be easy to stop. Yeah. <laughs> but it's pleasurable. But we've got to dig deep into God's word. We've got to apply it to our lives. And we need to surround ourselves with people who are going to help us do it. Yep. Checking your desire to read a scripture, or sorry, checking your device to read the scripture of the day is not what Proverbs 2 is talking about. Mm -hmm. Hey, I feel good about myself because mm -hmm. I read the scripture of the day. Well, have you meditated on that? Have you prayed about it? Are you trying to apply it in your life? Are you looking to how that connects to other things? We need to seek wisdom as a treasure. We need to study and learn and apply. Then we will know the truth. And then we'll learn what it means mm. to fear the Lord. My challenge for us this week okay. is to pray for God to reveal in your heart, do I truly treasure wisdom? Not the wisdom of the world, but God's wisdom. And then, as you spend some time praying, get with someone and talk to them about what God is teaching you in your heart. Mm. And come up with a plan. Hey, how can I move forward from this? As we prepare to take communion, obviously you can see Glenn right there. He's going to come down and pray. But I wanted to finish with 1 Corinthians chapter 1. As those who have made a decision to follow Christ, to walk in that direction, Here's what Paul had to say to the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Yeah. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So that follows the